hands and that sort of thing, really is more for carrying it to somebody else. That's always the concern, is can I carry it, you know, um, to somebody else? Because you may not be in that vulnerable class, you know? I'm still not convinced that most of the people that get the COVID and then say that they hadn't had any, any reaction to it at all, they're like, no, I hadn't felt the thing, but I tested positive, I didn't, you didn't have it. You'd have to prove that to me, do an antibody test and prove that to me, because I don't believe it, because I don't know how in the world you could have had what I had and had nothing go on. I just don't believe it. That's the difference in the COVID and then the COVID in your lungs. Yeah, when it gets in your lungs, it's definitely worse, for sure. So. All right, Luke chapter number 10. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Lighthouse. Hopefully you can hear a little bit better. Uh, we tried to move it a little closer, get a little microphone up here, and I hope that the sound quality is improved a little bit. We're going to begin in Luke chapter number 10, starting in verse number 38. I'd ask if you stand with me as we read the word together. Starting in verse number 38. Now it came to pass as they went that they entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Somebody say, she sat at his feet. She sat at his feet. And heard his word. And heard his word. Mm -hmm. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, to that she come and help me. Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. Many things. By the way, notice this is careful and troubled. Careful and troubled often go together. I'll, I'll cover that in a minute. You are careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. Say one thing is needful. One thing is needful. Just one, Jesus? Man, I got a list, but just one. One thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. I want to talk to you today on five steps to a reset. Five steps. This is unorthodox for me. Many preachers preach things like this, and it's not something that I normally do. It's out of the, but God dropped it on me. And wanted me to deliver it for you. So I believe that there's some people in here that need a reset. Hallelujah. I'm just believing God that there's people listening that may need a reset. And, and so God gave me five steps to a reset. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we trust in the word of God. We trust in the living Holy Ghost that breathes and quickens that word both on the way out and on the way into our spirits. I pray, Lord, that everyone that hears this word, that they would receive it. By faith. For if the word is preached and not mixed with faith, it does not profit. God, I pray for faith to lay hold of the word that is preached today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. And I do have notes up here, um, which y'all can get afterwards. I find that if I give the notes out early, you start reading and stop listening. And it's better that you listen and read later. Amen. amen. So five steps to a reset. Somebody say reset. reset. Now some people, some people may not even know what a reset is necessarily. You know, you reset your phone. You know, they may understand that. Or you reset your computer or something like that. And when you reset your computer, it goes all the way off and closes out every little thing. And then comes back on and begins the startup program from the beginning. But in my day, a reset, you know, the video games that we had in the 80s, you could never beat the game. You couldn't beat the game for my, my young folks here, you know, and, and somewhere along the way. And the reason that they were so hard was because they were in the arcade. They didn't have home games. They were in the arcade. And so they couldn't make it too easy because they needed you to keep putting quarters in. Mm -hmm. Right? So when they started making home games, they realized, wait a minute, nobody's going to buy a game that they can only get to the third level on. So they started to make them easier. The first couple Super Mario games were hard. Now you could play one of the new Super Mario games and be done in six hours. Am I right? You just finished the whole game. You paid $80 for the game, and 
you finished it in a day. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> right? But the video games we had in the 80s, you could never beat the game. You all, your only hope was to get to the next level. Right? And, and, and maybe you were, you were trying to get to level four. Like, the, you, you never really made it to level four. Or you never made it far. Maybe you just broke into level four and died. Like, and so you were, you were trying to break through and maybe even beat level four. And, and, uh, but in order for you to get to the next level, you had to have a great start. If you were not progressing like you wanted to in order to reach the next level, you wouldn't waste time continuing. You would just hit the reset button. Any, anybody know what, what I'm talking about or am I talking crazy? Anybody understand what I'm talking about? Because, because you, you, you needed to have a good start in order to reach your goal. And so if you weren't progressing like you had hoped and wanted to, instead of wasting time, wandering and, and, and just, just wasting your time because you know you're not on the road to getting to where you need to be, you would hit a reset. Does anybody need a reset today? Yes. Somebody, see, some, somebody, I want you to take this in, and it's not about, this is not a, a, a consult about video game uh, winning. This is about life. This is about the kingdom life. And, and sometimes when you're not getting to your destination, and you're not progressing the way that you should be, you need a reset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Stop, stop continuing on when you're off course. Stop continuing. Oh, okay. Sometimes you got to stop and go back. Sometimes you need to go back to the beginning and start over. Mm -hmm. ah. See, sometimes you, sometimes you need to reset. And this message may not be for everybody, but I believe there'll be something in there you can grab hold of. But some of us, we, 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 we need a reset. A reset was more than just a do-over. A reset was about capturing momentum. Because momentum can cause you to go farther and accomplish more than you possibly could on your own. Somebody say momentum. A smaller man can take down a bigger man if he has momentum. I wonder what you could do if you just had some momentum. You understand what I mean by momentum. You're moving and moving. You're, you're, you're on a roll. Anybody, you, you, just, you just get on a roll. And then what happens? You, you could be on a roll spiritually. You're just trucking along, and it seems like you're going from glory to glory to glory. And then all of a sudden, something happens, and you've lost your momentum. You didn't lose your salvation. You didn't lose your right standing with God. You didn't lose his love, but you lost your momentum. And sometimes the real frustration that we have with ourselves is that I was going so good. I was tracking with God. I was running the race, and I got knocked off. My momentum. Somebody say momentum. Momentum. momentum is such an important thing. I wonder if sometimes all the devil has to do is knock us off our game so that we lose our momentum. Mm. If I have some momentum, I can run through some stuff. I can leap over a wall. I can run through a troop, but I need a running start. Come on, somebody. The Bible, the Bible describes the Christian life as a walk, but it also describes it as a run. As a race, all run to win the race. And he says, let us lay aside the weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. See, the sins and the weights are the things that knock us off of, off of our balance. It knocks our balance off. It knocks us back. It causes us to lose our momentum. Listen, you don't have to necessarily be going fast, but you got to be going steady. The race is not given to the swift or to the strong, but to the one that endures to the end. It's a marathon race, not a sprint. It's not a hundred yard dash. It's a, it, it, it's a long run. And, and, and one of the things that a runner had to do was have the right pace. And, and, and weights and those things would cause, could cause you to lose your stride. Amen? Somebody say, I gotta get my momentum back. See, without momentum, we have no confidence. Without confidence, we often quit before we even try. So today I want to talk about reset. Somebody say reset. In particular, five steps to a reset. See, many of us, as I was preparing this message, I realized many of us need a, need a new year right now. Amen. We need a new year right, right now. We, we, we can't wait for January 1st to hit the reset button. We need a reset yeah. right now. We need a new year Right now, and that's the, that's the good thing about the kingdom of God. It is not subject to the calendars that we create. Even though God moves within time, 
God can give you a reset right now. Amen. So if you need a reset, if you've just been worn out, you know how many people, how many negative things I see about 2020? Frankly so. I know this year in so many ways has been a disaster. But just because that's a disaster doesn't mean you have to be a disaster. Amen. But I need a reset. In fact, sometimes, sometimes because the year was so disastrous, maybe, maybe you're giving yourself permission to be a disaster. Be careful because the flesh is deceptive too. I realized that my flesh was as deceptive as the devil. And my flesh would set me up to sin. If you haven't found this out, you're just not paying attention. Your flesh likes, your flesh and your natural mind, your mind likes your flesh better than your spirit. It does. They, they run together. They ran together your whole life. They like, they like hanging out each other. That's why you have to wash your mind. you got to cleanse your mind. you got to completely renew your mind so that your mind begins to take its cue and connect with your spirit more than your flesh. And I realized that my mind would set me up along with my flesh. Amen? But if you know how the devil works, we're not, we're not weary of his devices. We understand how he works. The reason he gives us that information in the scriptures is so that, not so that you can get depressed out of how many times we fell into his trap, but we can look and say, oh, that's how that joker works. I see that now. I see that now. So I don't have to succumb to that. Amen? So I'm going to give you the five keys. Number one, the first one is simplify. Simplify. The truth of the matter is, is that we are just, we have, we're, our lives are just too complicated. Amen. Our lives are just too complicated. One of the things that the Antichrist does is it says, it says that he will wear out the saints. Yeah, you know, I mean, Christians are just worn out. They can't sleep, can't rest, can't even go to church because they're just so busy. We're so busy, we can't, we can't pray. We can't read our Bible. We can't sit down and play with our granddaughter because we're so busy Come on, somebody. We need to simplify. Amen. We need to simplify. Listen, Jesus says to Martha, he says, Martha, you are cumbered about. You're cumbered about. In other words, cumbered about means that, that you're so crowded. Everything is crowded in on you. You have so much crowding you out in your life. You're, you're, you're cumbered about with a great many things. And then he says, and then he says, you are careful and troubled about many things. Now, careful is one of those words. Careful doesn't mean when you're going across the street, somebody says, be careful. You know, or when you're going out nowadays because of COVID or whatever, you know, everybody's like, well, be careful. That's not that careful. That's a modern careful. You have to understand the careful of the Bible is a word that was invented by um, Tyndale, William Tyndale. As he was finishing the New Testament and really bringing Tyndale, William Tyndale was the person who really brought the English language because it was a slammed combination of German and Latin and different things kind of slammed together. And he honed it and he perfected it and brought it to a level uh, a lot of people think it was Shakespeare. It wasn't Shakespeare. It was William Tyndale. Shakespeare benefited from Tyndale's work. But one of the things that William Tyndale did as he's crafting the English language is he would do a thing called word scaffolding. Word scaffolding is where you take two words and you put them together and the word has the meaning of both words. So careful. What are the two words there? Full and care. Careful means full of care. He said, you're full of care. It's not that you're careful. I'm just being careful about where I place this and where. No, not that careful. You're full of care. And Jesus said, cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. How is he going to fix your problem when you hold on to it all day? How is he ever going to make a difference for you if you insist on doing it yourself? Martha, you're careful. You're full of care about a great many things. And notice that careful and troubled go together. 
Because when you're full of care, trouble is not far behind. When your mind is set on the problem and you are thinking about the problem and you are full of care, I promise you trouble is just around the corner. <laughs> Amen? Is anybody getting anything out of this? You're full of care. Hmm. We're often missing the one thing. Jesus says to, Jesus says to Martha, he says, one thing is needful. I, I bet that if we took a, a poll, if everybody had a piece of paper and listed out the needful things, the things you need to do this week, you'd fill the paper. You'd fill the paper, wouldn't you? Amen? And um, Jesus said, one thing is needful. And what's amazing about that is, is often all the other stuff on our paper crowds out that one thing, doesn't it? Because that's really what it's after anyway. It's really after that one thing. What was the one thing that was needful? What, what exactly was Mary doing? It says Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet, Amen. listening to his word. Yes. Do you know that, that Mary, that is, Mary set the pattern of worship for the church? Because that's what we do. We come in and we sit at his feet. That's what worship is. We, we, we come in and we praise the Lord. Some generations did it with hymns and some did it without instruments and some do it with, with, with new music and overheads and smoke machines or whatever. But it's still coming in to sit at Jesus' feet and then hear his word. And Jesus said, there's only one thing that's needful. I find it fascinating that we are in the most tumultuous time of my entire 50 years on this earth. And yet Christians have decided that church is optional. One thing is needful. Whatever else you're doing. Somebody said, wait, wait, I, I get that from TVN. I, I, I get that, I get that all off the internet. I, I, I listen to several, several minutes. No, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. First of all, that's just you filling you. Paul said, when you come together, every one of you has something to give. How are you going to do that by yourself at home? On your computer you don't Paul later said he said do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together and then he said even more so as you see the day what day there's only one day he could be referring to as the day the day of Jesus when he returns so as you see the day approaching you should gather together more not less and I don't care what the governor says, I don't care if it becomes illegal to go to church. I'm going to do like the, like the Christians in China and go underground. Amen. I'm going to find me an underground church where people are worshiping Jesus. I'm not going to go to, to some, to some government-sponsored church where they refuse to preach the word of God and they teach self-help and this and that and the other thing. I'm going to worship Jesus. I'm going to sit at his feet. It's Sunday. I'm going to sit at his feet and I'm going to listen for his word. Somebody said, well, I, I just don't get fed at my church. Listen, that's a bunch of hogwash. You need to go back to your church. Wherever you're sitting it out and you're watching me today and you've sat out and you've decided not to go back to your church because they don't feed you like Stephen Furtick feeds you or they don't, they don't feed you like Charles Stanley feeds you. That's a bunch of nonsense. Number one, you're supposed to eat on your own. Church isn't for you to come eat. Church is for you to come be. Church is for you to come participate. Church is for you to come engage God. It's not for you to come and just sit down and have a meal. You're supposed to eat on your own. And if you were eating on your own, you would find out that your pastor, who you think wasn't that good of a preacher, maybe was saying a lot more than you realized, but you weren't connected because you're comparing him to somebody he can never be. Well, I just like T.D. Jakes. Well, go on and move to Texas then and go to T.D. Jakes Church. But if you can't drive out there on a Sunday morning, you need to find a church and you need to plug in. Amen? One thing is needful. One thing. One thing. So what's taking up your time that needs to go on that list? I mean, what, what, what's the stuff that just needs to go? What is stealing your peace and causing you to worry and to stress? 
it needs to go. Or at least it needs to bow the knee to the one thing. Somebody say the one thing. <laughs> the one thing. And I'm not saying that the one thing is only going to church. Amen. It's sitting at his feet. You ought to have a daily encounter with God. In fact, if you don't make it a habit to have a daily encounter with God, when you do come to church, you will put on church to make up for your entire life of neglecting God. And when they can't do it, because they can't do it, but when they can't do it, then you figure there's something wrong with the church. No, there's something wrong with you. You need to spend time with God. That's like saying, that's like saying, well, I haven't eaten all week, but I'm going to go to grandma's house. She's going to cook me a great meal. And while it satisfied me, it didn't give me enough nourishment to make up for all the weight I lost all. Grandma can cook, but she can't cook that good. I can't, I can feed you the day you come, but I can't feed you from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Amen. Where do I find the food, Pastor James? It's right here. It's right here. Just eat it. Well, I don't understand it. I read the Bible and I don't understand it. Nobody told you you had to understand it. I don't understand steak. I don't. I don't understand how the steak goes in and becomes part of my liver and my kidneys and my body knows how to pull the iron and put it in my blood and knows how to do it. I don't understand any of that. I mean, I guess I could figure it out if I wanted to study it, but I, I just like steak. I, I just like steak, amen? Your job is not to understand this book. Your job is to read it. And the more that you read it, the more you will understand it. You're trying to understand it in order to read it. And God says, if you read it, I'll give you understanding. Yeah, come on. Psalm 119 says, it gives understanding to the simple. Right. Amen? <sighs> simple. Simplify. Somebody say simplify. Mm -hmm. So how can I simplify life so that I don't miss the one thing that... Is needful. That's the first point. Somebody say simplify. Number two, go back to basics. Go back to the basics. One of the things about a reset is that you go back and you do the first works. You go back and level one now because you've done level one on that game so many times. You can practically do it with your eyes closed because you're familiar with that. And, and sometimes when you're entering into a level that you're not familiar with, it helps to go back and rehearse what you are familiar with. Somebody say go back to the beginning. Um, when in Genesis 35, we're not gonna, we're not going to read that, but Jacob is in trouble. Jacob is afraid. Jacob ha has is afraid of his neighbors, and, and and there was his sons did something very terrible, and there was fear, and 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 so God says to him, He says, go back to Bethel. Go back to the place where you first met me. Go back to the place where you were asleep and saw a ladder going up and down from heaven. Go back to the place where it was simple because Jacob only had a rock for his pillow. Because all he had was a natural faith. All he had was, he didn't, he didn't have, see the problem is we become too saved and too Christian and too practiced in how things are. We, we often need to go back and remember what it was when just the simplicity of reading the scriptures or hearing hearing songs that, that, that minister to you, what it did to you at the beginning. Somebody say, go back to the beginning. Go back to the place where you first met me. Go back. In, in Revelation chapter 2, he tells the church, he said, you've left your first love. Yeah. He said, you've left your first love. In Revelation 2, he says, 4 and 5, he says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you've left your first love. Remember from where you are fallen. Where'd you fall from? Remember where you were and where you fell. Repent and do the first work. Somebody say, remember, remember. repent, redo. Remember, repent, redo. That's, that's Jesus' recipe for recovering yourself out of losing your first love. Remember who he is. Somebody say, remember. Remember who he is. Remember what he did. Remember his sacrifice. Remember his life. Read the Gospels and remember everything that he did. Remember who you were before he found you, before you knew the songs and the lyrics, before you knew how to quote this scripture or that scripture, before you understood anything in Christianese, before you brought anything to the table, when you were a mess. One, one verse says, you were covered in filth and in blood, and I took you and I washed you and I cleaned you up and called you to myself. 
Remember who you were. Remember who he was when you were who you were. Remember how he found you. Remember what it was like to be changed. Remember that he found you and he, he, didn't, he didn't expect anything from you. Remember what it was like when he didn't expect anything from you and you didn't either. You remember that? You were just happy to be saved. I'll go all the way back to the beginning. You'll, you'll find it. You'll find it. Because while you were still, when you had just stepped out of your old person and you got born again, you didn't have any confidence that you would be able to measure up. Somewhere along the way, we forget. We need to go back and remember. Somebody say remember. And then repent means to turn back. Turn around. You're going the wrong way. Amen? Remember, repent, and then redo. Somebody say, do the first works. Go back, go back and do those things that you did at the beginning. I don't know what you did at the beginning. I know what I did at the beginning. I know that in the first two years of being saved, I had accelerated growth, not because, not because of who I was going to be or any of that, but because, I, because of what I did. It was real simple. Somebody say, simplify. <laughs> it was real simple, but it was, it was a habit. It was a habit. I watched this. This was this was what I what I turned into. Okay, I read the Bible all the time, not just like once a day. I had Bibles with me. I would go into restaurants and 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 you know we get in get in get out of the car and go into the restaurant. Didn't matter if we were with friends or other people, and we're all walking in and and I got a Bible somewhere tucked away. Why are you bringing the Bible? Why wouldn't I? Amen. These have better thoughts than mine anyway. Amen. I was, I was writing down scriptures. I was, I was trying to memorize scriptures. I tried to memorize so many scriptures. At one point, I tried to memorize the entire book of James. Love the book of James. I'm going to memorize this whole thing. I almost had it too, I think. You know. But I was trying to memorize scripture and commit it because when you try to memorize it, 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 you're working on it over and over and over again, saying it over and over again, and you're pushing it deeper in your heart. And it's the word you have in your heart that has more power. It's not the word you have in your head. Not just because you can quote it. Amen? Amen? Some people quote it. They don't have the depths of what it means. Right. Amen? So I was memorizing scripture. I was reading the Bible. I was listening to TV preachers. We didn't have a thing called TVN. There were no Christian, Christian stations whatsoever. On Sunday, there were preachers that came on TV, and I would record them onto VHS. I had... Uh, ben, what is his name? I, I, can't, I can't remember his name. Um, John Osteen was my favorite. Uh, but Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar, whoever came on my station, most of them, um, I recorded it, and I was watching it and taking notes and learning and listening. I would read books. But before I really got into reading books and studying, I didn't know how to study words. In the early days, I didn't study, I didn't look for the Greek and the Hebrew. I just read it. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, I got more reading it yeah. than studying it. Mm. Trust me when I tell you, you will grow more when you just read this than if, if I teach you all the different methods of studying. You will get more. Somebody look at me like they don't believe it. Trust me when I tell you. So go back to the basics. These were the things that I did at the beginning. You know, the times of prayer. I would create a space in the house. So at one place, it was a basement. We had a basement. You guys don't have basements in Louisiana because, you know, you wouldn't have a house, you know, because it's a wetlands, you know. I don't think you can have basements here because it just, just wouldn't work, hey, man. But I, I would carve out a little spot in the basement, and the basement was only maybe from that chair to these chairs here anyway. But I have, you know, the washing machine and the dryers over here and stuff. You know, that you didn't know where to put was all around. But I'd create and find a little space, a little place in the thing. And I, I'd, I'd have my, my Bible. I'd have different things. And I'd just go down there with my boom box. And I'd put on my tape, my cassette tape of Vineyard Worship. And I'd just fall out in the presence of God. I'd pick up my Bible and walk back and forth and read the, book, read the word of God out loud. I'd preach to myself. I'd preach to myself. You can't preach if you can't preach to yourself. Long before anybody would ever listen to me, I was preaching to James. Because <laughs> James needed it and still needs his head. Not examined, but renewed. Amen. <laughs> 
So somebody said, go back and do the first works. So simplify. Number two, go back to the basics. Go back to reading your Bible. Go back to the simple things. Stop letting even your Christian life be overcomplicated. Amen? I learned how to confess the word of God. Many of you were taught and learned how to confess the word of God, and we have left that alone. Go back to it. Amen? Go back to praying in the Holy Ghost. Go back to speaking in tongues when nobody's around. You shouldn't just speak in tongues, pray in tongues here. Speaking in tongues is a gift that's exercised in the church that is coupled with an interpretation that is the same thing as prophecy designed to build up the body. But praying in the spirit, praying in tongues, is a private prayer language in which the Holy Spirit uses your spirit to pray directly to God the will of God as he sees it. Perfect prayer. Amen? And some people are waiting for a feeling, waiting for this, waiting for that. No, go back to praying in the Holy Ghost. Go back to praying. Go back to making lists. Some of you, you your, your first works was you were called to prayer, and you started making prayer lists. You were writing down. You had prayer lists for everybody. Every time you were getting something, really? Your aunt is, what's her name again? And you were writing that stuff down, and you take it before the Lord, and you were praying those things out. You are praying for people. That was your first works. I'm not telling you to go back and do my first works. That's not going to help you. I'm saying go back and do your first works. What did you do? Now, if you don't have a first works, if you like, you're like, well, I got saved and then I just kind of landed here. All right, well, then go do mine. You know, read your Bible, pray, create yourself a space. Amen. Go back, but, but keep it simple. Yeah. Amen. Keep it simple and allow God to transform you. Number three. Number three. So simplify. Go back to the basics. Number three. This is huge. Cultivate contentment. Cultivate contentment. Our world is driven by covetousness and not contentment. Covetousness is the desire of the thing that you don't have while not appreciating the thing that you... So I'm going to say contentment. Cultivate contentment. Look at these scriptures. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. He's going to put it on the screen. It says... And he said unto them, take heed, beware of covetousness. You know, when, some, when somebody says, especially Jesus says, beware of something, you know, the, that word beware, most of us are familiar with that because we see a sign that says beware of dog or beware high voltage. You know, this is, look, danger, 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 Will Robinson, <laughs> danger, right? Jesus said, take heed and beware of covetousness. Yet we court covetousness. Like it's somebody we actually want to be friends with. And Jesus said, you need to run from covetousness. In fact, covetousness was mentioned several times in the Ten Commandments. Lying was mentioned once. Covetousness was mentioned repeatedly. Take heed, beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things in which he possesses. Hebrews 13 and 5. Let your conversation be, by the way, by the way that word conversation there is not, is not your speech, although it contains that part. It's your lifestyle. It's your manner of living. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 12. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing in this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Can I get an amen? amen? And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich, or those that are wanting to be rich, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many harmful and foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in perdition and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O oh man, flee these things. Flee means to run as if in terror. Flee these things and follow after. That, that phrase follow after means to pursue. Somebody say pursue. Pursue, pursue what? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. So on one hand, he tells us what to run from, and he tells us what to run after. Amen? 
He says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold of eternal life. So wait a minute, it sounds kind of like a contradiction because one thing, he's saying fight the good fight of faith, but when you think of contentment, you think of just being still. And contentment is not que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, and just sitting back and letting life idly beat you down or whatever comes your way. Because he says specifically, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. That word eternal life is zoe. Lay hold of the life that God has for you. Lay hold of the provisions that God has for you. Amen? Amen. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession among many witnesses. Philippians 4, 11 through 12. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned. Somebody say, you've got to learn this. Is not something that comes naturally. Contentment is not something that's going to come naturally even after you're born again. Just because you're born again doesn't mean that you're not going to wrestle with, that you're going to have contentment and you're not going to wrestle with covetousness. No, covetousness is natural and contentment is not natural. It's something that you need to learn. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned, this is Paul, in whatever state I'm in, therewith to be content. He said, I know how to be abased. That means to be humbled. And I know how to abound. I know Christians that know how to be abased but don't know how to abound. They refuse to accept any time that God will pick them up. And I know people that are the exact opposite. But I find more often that Christians have trouble abounding. I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. I like that. Both to be full and to be hungry. Amen. I'm always hungry for him. Hungry for his word. But yet at the same time I can be full. Now that doesn't make any natural sense. Because in the natural the minute you're full you're not hungry. And when you're hungry it's because you're not full. But in the spirit. You can be instructed both to be full. And hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. I think David really captured this idea of, of cultivating contentment. And, and when, when in Psalm 23, verse number one, when he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When I was a kid, I didn't understand that. We had to memorize Psalm 23 as a kid in Methodist, in Methodist Sunday school. And I'm glad I did because I still have it today, you know. And uh, I think that was a really good thing to memorize scripture as a child. And, uh, but Psalm 23, verse 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I was reading it like this. It didn't make any sense to me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Like I didn't want him to be my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Like, like it was like a burden or something. Because I didn't understand the natural man or boy in this case does not understand the things of the spirit. Right? So I didn't understand. Want is an old English word. Now, now many, many newer versions will say, um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. And it would be appropriate to take that, that Hebrew word and call it lack. But I like want better, even though it's, it's more an old English word. I, I like that, that, that it says want over lack. Because I know people that have no lack, and yet they want everything. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it is possible for you to lack many things, and yet not want anything. Amen. How, how, could, how, could Paul, I, I, how could Paul be writing from a jail cell and teaching us about contentment? Right? When we're chasing the, you know, you have a car, but I need a newer car. I need a faster car, a better car, prettier car, whatever. Amen. And so what happens with, with when we don't cultivate contentment and we, and we are covetous, we have a tendency we covet what we don't have, and we neglect what we do have. So you let the blessing that you already have go to, you don't clean it, you don't wash it, right? You don't take care of it, but you want something better. So you want God to give you something more when you don't appreciate what, how many of you like to give your children more when they don't appreciate what you've already, I'm just going to leave it right there because I think we all just got slapped in the head. Now, that does not mean that if God has promised you something to be content without it. It's very important. 
Content with such things that you have, talking about the things of life and, and food and raiment and different things like that and status and this and that, all of that. That's worldly stuff. But that doesn't mean that if God has promised you something, that you are to be content without it. When God has promised you something, do not rest. Do not allow him to rest. He was the one who said, knock and keep on knocking until he, he, he used an example. He said, he said there was a person that was knocking late at night and he, he needed something and he said, he, he needed something from his friend. He said, I have a visitor come and I need, I need, I have nothing to set before him. I need you to come out. He's like, we're, everybody's in bed. I'm not getting up. And he said, and because he, he, he kept, kept, he refused to take no for an answer. It says, though the man would not give it to him because of their relationship, he gave it to him because of his shameless persistence. His shameless persistence. And, and he used that. You go read the scripture for yourself. Jesus is teaching on prayer. Look at it. I don't know off the top of my head. Amen. When God has promised you something, do not rest. Do not allow him to rest. And the knock and the door will be open. Do not give up. Don't settle for life without it. If it's, I'm not talking about what you want. Where do wars and fightings come from? It comes from your desires because you desire to have and cannot obtain. I'm not talking about that, the things that you want. I'm talking about the things that God has promised to you. He's promised that your children are going to be saved. All your children shall be taught of the Lord. Great is the peace of my children, all of my children. So until that happens, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I, I'm not giving the Lord rest. Father, you said in your word, you promised in your word. Don't do it one time and let it go. Keep praying. Keep confessing. Yeah. Keep Stay on top of that thing. Listen, the circumstances and the thing that is screaming the opposite information doesn't stop, does it? So why do you? Well, I believe you just pray and believe God and then just pray and ask one time. And he, No, that's not what he said. Keep knocking. When do I get to stop knocking? When somebody opens the door. The promises of God in him are yes and in him amen. But they must be received. You're going to have to fight to lay hold of them. You can't be content in a fight. You can't win a fight with an attitude of contentment. I'm, contentment with, I'm content with where I am in life. But I am not content to suffer lack at the hands of the enemy. I am not content to go without the promises of God. Amen? Everybody understand that dichotomy, that difference? It's very important because people will start working on getting content and then they'll just lay down. What are you doing? How come you're not fighting the devil? You're sick in your body. Why aren't you confessing the word? How come you're not reading stuff? How come you're not, you're not filling your mouth full of the promises of God? Well, uh, the Bible says to be content with whatever I have. So I'm content with this cancer. No, the devil is a lie. He didn't tell you to be content with cancer. He told you to be content with food and clothing and raiment and the things that you have, amen, and not wanting what your brother has. Everyone understand? Let me see your hand if you, if you understand what I'm saying. Some of y'all just raise your hand, so I'll move on. <laughs> just think about the Jews' homeland and how much resistance in history has occurred to stop them from, from possessing the promised land. Constant. There's always, listen, there will always be giants stationed in your promised land. There will always be resistance, the most resistance around the promise. And so it's going to take a fight for you to hold on to the promise. If you think you can just pray, get a scripture, grab a scripture, confess it a few times, and move on, and suddenly uh, everything's going to be different, um, you, you, you're, you're believing in the Santa Claus God. Santa Claus is nothing like God. Amen? Amen? All right, so that's three. Simplify, go back to basics, cultivate contentment. Cultivate it like you would cultivate a garden. Number four, focus on what you have, not what you don't have. I'm going to be quick with this. There, there, there's a story in 2 Kings where Elisha uh, goes to this widow woman, or this widow, this widow woman comes, comes to him, and she says, I'm in debt. Uh, my son is about to be sold to pay for the debt. Everything I own, I'm about to lose everything I own. To, be, to, to pay for this debt. And if you look in uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse number 2, Elijah said unto her, What shall I do for thee? That's the first thing. Okay? Then the second thing, What do you have in your house? 
God will always turn your attention not to what you don't have, but what you do have. Because the miracle is not in what you're lacking, but in what you have. The miracle is in what you have. The provision is in what you have. We're always taught to look at what we don't have and not pay any attention to what we do have. After all, I just have a few jars. She had just a few jars and she had some oil. And he said, go borrow a bunch of jars. Go borrow as many as you can find. Borrow jars from everybody. And as she borrowed the jars, the oil, the little bit of oil that she had, filled every jar until they were all full. And literally, not only did he provide for her house and did he provide for the debt, she went into the oil business. She was an oil tycoon. Amen? Because God super abundantly provided, but the answer was not in what was missing. She was focused on what was missing. My husband is dead. That was the breadwinner. Women can't get a job in this society, and they're getting ready to take my son away as payment. I am done. There's nothing. I have nothing. And the prophet says, well, what do you got left? I promise you that the answer is not in what's missing, but it's always in what do you have left. I like, how, I like how Andrew comes to Jesus and he brings the little boy's lunch. You know, Jesus says, he says, how in the world are we going to feed all these people? You know, how much money, he asked his disciples, he said, how much do you think it would take money-wise to feed all these people? There were 5,000 men plus women and children, at least 9,000 people. How much do you think? And I could, I could see the disciples trying to add it up, thinking, you know, I, I don't think we've ever had that much in the money bag. It's even before Judas started handling the, the finances. I, I don't think we've ever, I mean, it would cost, what do you think? And they're, they're sitting there adding up. They're focused on what is missing. They're focused on what they can't do. They're focused on what they can provide. And I love Andrew. Andrew's Peter's brother, by the way. Most people don't know Andrew. They know Peter. But, but just, just so you know, Andrew was always bringing stuff to Jesus. <laughs> he, he, wasn't a, he wasn't a good preacher. I don't, I, I don't know. You know, we, we, don't, we don't know much about his writings. He didn't write any letters. We don't, we don't know a whole lot about Andrew. Everybody knows about Peter. Peter wrote 1 Peter, 2 Peter. He was one of the pillars in the church. He was the guy who cut off the ear. You know, all this stuff. You know, later on in life, they say he was crucified upside down and because he didn't feel like he was worthy to be killed the same way. All this stuff about Peter. Peter, Peter, Peter. Peter's the rock. Peter's the first pope. He, first of all, he's not. But regardless of that, everybody loves Peter, but nobody pays any attention to Andrew. But guess who brought Peter to Jesus? Andrew. Andrew was the first one to find the Messiah. And immediately he went and he got his brother. And he said, we found him who is called the Messiah. And he brought, he brought Peter. So if you like Peter, you wouldn't have Peter without Andrew. Because Andrew's always bringing to Jesus. So now here, all the disciples are running around trying to count up and figure out what, what they need and how much money they don't have and everything. And, and, and Andrew is looking around for what they do have. Well, what do we got? What do we got? You have, you have a lunch? Okay, five loaves. All right, well, let me, let me bring it to him. You know, I mean, I mean, this is all we have. And Andrew was focused on what he had. And, and, and Jesus took what they had and he lifted it up to heaven and he blessed it. Maybe the reason that it's not meeting the need is because we don't bless what we have. Do you know how many people prayed for a job when they didn't have a job? And now they're cursing that same job. Because what's changed? Them. Their mindset. They don't see it as a blessing anymore. Now it's a curse. They pull up in the parking lot and they're like, Jesus, give me strength today. Because one more person says one more thing to me. I'm just going to lose it. And yet the first day when they got that job, they're like, praise God. I thank you for this job. You have provided for me so abundantly. And, and, and what was the difference? They're both the provision of God. The only thing that changed is your perspective. Now somebody said, no, I, I got a new boss. It doesn't matter what boss you got. Amen? You're supposed to have a good boss everywhere you go. You can't, listen, you can't be faithful under an unfaithful person. If you can't be faithful under, uh, under an unfaithful person, then you just can't be faithful. Daniel served three corrupt kings. And his witness and his testimony brought two of them to the knowledge that there is no God. Except Daniel's God. 
Maybe you're in that position with that boss to bear witness to the glory and the grace of God. And instead, we're busy looking at it and we are cursing our provision and can't figure out why the provision doesn't meet the need. Jesus took what they had and blessed him. So key number four or five, is it? Four, yeah. Key number four is focus on what you have, not what you don't have. Number five. What's eating you? I'm almost done. I'm almost done. We'll get you to the restaurant. What's eating you? Now, some of you are like, that's just a weird thing there. But if you were, if you're my age or older, you understand that phrase because that was a phrase, especially if you're from the Northeast, and it may have been more of a Northeastern kind of Italian neighborhood kind of thing. You know, and it, it was said this way, you know, when somebody was, when somebody, you know, they had a sourpuss look, you know, and they're just kind of like, you know, you can, you can tell they're just kind of in a bad mood, you know, good morning. And you'd be like, hey, what's eating you? It means, what's the matter with you? What's wrong? Okay. What's eating you? And, 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 and so b before I answer the what's eating you question, what's really troubling you, what's really bothering you, i got to ask you this question. What are you eating? Hmm. What are you eating? Because it, it could very well be that what you're eating is eating you. We also had this commercial back in the day, you know, that would come on, you know, people, commercials is what they would put in between the video <laughs> to make money and stuff. Because people watch stuff and they don't even know what a commercial is anymore. My baloney has a first name. It's always C-A-R. See, y'all don't have any great commercials like that. Starkist and Charlie's Tuna and all that. You, you, don't, you don't know nothing about that. <laughs> You're just missing out. But one of those commercials was basically said, you are what you eat from your head down to your feet. Right? And it's true. It's true. Whatever you eat becomes part of you, right? Yeah. Your body takes it and uses it, and it becomes part of you. So in, in reality, you are what you eat. So I, I just want to ask you, I, I want to ask you, um, what are the things that, are, that you're eating? And I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, I'm not talking about the physical things. You know, some people, we eat too much sugar, we eat too much. And I think there's, there, there's wisdom in that as well, because... Oftentimes, the things that we put into our bodies wear us out, stress us out, give us hypertension and headaches or heart conditions or whatever. So, and I, I don't want people to go overboard and start, and start doing all kinds of things with their appetites and things like that. But we ought to get some sort of control over our appetites. Amen? It, the, the Bible says one of the things about the heathen, it says, whose God is their belly. Does your belly tell you when to eat, what to eat. Now that's just the physical, but, but I really want to hone in on the mental, emotional, and the spiritual. What are you eating? What music do you default to? What music do you default to? Well, every now and then I've got on some worship music, but you know I like my country. Well, no wonder you're so depressed. Right? Well, I, I like, I, I always like my hardcore rock and roll. Mmm, <clears throat> screaming demons. You know? And can't figure out why I'm listening to screaming demons, but can't hear God, still small voice. Listen, it's what you're feeding your spirit. And you are what you eat. And what if what you eat is eat, actually eating you? What TV shows do you default to? Do you come in and you automatically flip the news on? You hear bad news before you hear good news. And some of us, we listen to bad news and watch bad news all day. Yes, but I listen to accurate news. I don't care if it's accurate or not. It's still bad news. Right? I go, th I go through phases where I listen to news from 11 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the car. Rush and Hannity and then the news will be on at home and you watch those programs and can't figure out why you don't, you don't even like people, let alone love people. Because that stuff got in your, in your heart. And what I've been eating has been eating me. 
Mm -hmm. So unplug the news. Unplug. Turn, turn that music off. You call yourself safe. Stop listening to music that Jesus wouldn't listen to. Stop watching movies and things that Jesus wouldn't watch. Amen. I'm not talking about being tiptoeing and saying, you know, that, that he's going to kick me out of the kingdom because somebody said a curse word on that movie. I'm, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying you can't continue to feed your spirit and your soul junk food and expect to be a spiritual giant killer. It just doesn't compute. One of the things I just posted was, was an old thing uh, of John the Baptist and how John the Baptist spoke differently, affected things, and affected change for a generation because he ate different. And if you don't eat different, you can't talk different. You won't be different because you are what you eat. And what if what you're eating has been eating you? I gotta read this this poem that I that, that I uh, I found on the internet. I thought it was really good. It's by uh, an article by John Bloom. I don't know if it's a poem. He says, "Hope is to our soul what energy is to our body. Just like our bodies must have energy to keep going, our souls must have hope to keep going. When our body needs energy, we eat food. When our soul needs hope, what do we feed it? Promises. Why do we feed our soul promises?" Because promises have to do with our future, and hope is something we only feel about the future. About 10 minutes from now, 10 months from now, 10,000 years from now, we're never hopeful about the past. We can be grateful for the past, but the, and the past can inspire us and even guarantee a hopeful future for us. But all of the wonderful things that have happened to us in the past will not fuel our hope. If our future looks bleak. However, if our future is promising, our soul will be hopeful even in the presence of miserable circumstances because, we, because hope is what keeps the soul going. So we eat promises which our soul digests, believes, and converts to hope. Somebody say promises. So Simplify. Go back to the basics. Cultivate contentment. Focus on what you have. What's eating you? I want to encourage you. Pull out those old notebooks. Recount the revelations that God has given you. Unstop the wells that were providing you water. You know, the Philistines never wanted the water. They stopped up the wells so that you couldn't get the water. They didn't want the water. Those devils don't want the water. They, don't, they, don't, they have no use for it. They don't want it. They just want to make sure that you're not refreshed, that you're not refilled, that you're not replenished, that you're not at rest. They just want to make sure you don't have the promises of God, the well working, so they stop up the well. Huh. You open those wells back up and put those old words of prophecy back up. Put them before your eyes. Put them on the mirror so when you're brushing your teeth, you're looking at it. And this is what God said to me in, 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 in 1995. It don't matter how long ago it was because the promises of God, the prophecies of God have no expiration. Do you know how, how long ago Jesus was prophesied? The very first book, the very first word in the Bible was the first time Jesus was prophesied. That's a long time. Long time. Open those wells back up. Put that prophecy back up. Put those things in front of your face. Put them in your mouth. Put them on your lips. Share them with someone. Be careful who you share it with. You know, Joseph got in trouble because he shared his dreams with the wrong people. Because you'll always have dream killers and dream thieves. You know, so don't just share it with anybody. Share your testimony with everybody. But don't necessarily share the promises of God, what, what you're believing God for, what you're hoping God is going to do. Don't necessarily share those with just anybody. Because there'll be plenty of people that will say, well, you know, brother, sometimes God sends certain things. And, you know, the ways of God are past finding out. You just never know what God's going to do. No, I know exactly what God's going to do. The Bible says he watches over his word to perform it. His angels, he, he sets them loose and they excel in strength to bring forth his word. I know exactly what God does. He does his word. He fulfills his promises. You may not know what he does. 
because you want to live loosey-goosey. Whatever happens, happens. That way, when it happens, you don't blame yourself for not believing God and laying hold of the promise, fighting the good fight of faith. You point the finger at God and say, well, if he wanted me to have it, I would have had it. No. You're going to have to fight. The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. If you're going to possess the promised land, you're going to have to take it from some giants. If you're going to possess the promises of God, you're going to have to take it. Somebody say, take it. Stand to your feet. Somebody say, I need momentum. I need momentum. This is exactly, this is exactly what I needed because I need to get my momentum back. Mm -hmm. If you want the notes, they're, they're up here. You just... Just come and get them, but I just want you to be encouraged. God is saying it's time. It's time. He's giving you a reset right now. It's a season. It's a moment right now. This is not a message that I'm, that I'm apt to preach. Amen. In fact, I had other things that I was thinking about, and God, God gave this to me. I don't know who gave it to me for. I don't know who it was for, but um, uh, I know it was for me after I got it. Amen. Because I, I, I'm, 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 I'm ready to. Hit that reset button and go back to the beginning and start doing the first works. I'm ready to simplify my life. I'm ready to stop being so careful about so many things. I'm, I, I'm ready to, to, to thank him for the things that I have and look for the miracle and the provision in the things that I have and not constantly focused on the things that are missing. Amen. 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 Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, that that word is mixed with faith so that it may prosper and bring forth a work for your kingdom. I pray for that word in the name of Jesus. I bind the spirit of confusion. I bind the fowls of the air that they will not steal the seed of the word of God. But this word, this seed is governed by the angels of heaven. It is governed by the king of glory. And you will have no access or ability to remove it from the hearts of his people. God, I thank you in Jesus' name for what you're doing in our midst. Lord, I pray that even as we step back and we go back to the Bethel and go back to the beginning places and the beginning stages, Lord, I thank you that you're in the beginning. You're the author and you're the finisher. You're the one who began it and you're the one who will finish it. Lord, you've already been in our future and you're still in our past because there is no time with you. So when we go back and remember, we are with you. And when you move us on to that level that you're trying to take us to, I thank you, Lord God that you're there already before us. God bless your people. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Shalom. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday. Yes, ma'am.